Yeah, I mean, I really don't believe in blaming our parents. Like, mm. I don't think blame helps anybody. I do believe in understanding what's happened to you. If what you do is give your child a consequence, then often what you're doing is choosing the consequence yourself. And it's still a power dynamic with your child. It is still a punishment that you're choosing. It is a big ask because often we're asking them to turn off the telly on our terms. So they might be in the middle of an episode of Alvin and the Chipmunks and just... Put it into perspective. And I often will say this to parents. Think about what you would say to a best friend. Think about what words you would use. If your friend called you and said, I just shouted at my kid and I feel like I'm a monster and I'm a terrible parent, what would you say to them? You know, sometimes they will apologize, sometimes they won't, you know, because they're like, we did what was right. And that's okay. But they're obviously also witnessing something very different in how I parent my child. And we're rolling. Welcome to the Parenting Truths podcast. Today I'm joined by clinical psychologist and mum to a four-year-old, Dr. Marta. Thanks for joining me, Marta. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I really wanted to chat today because as someone that shares parenting content on social media, I find that your account in particular, you cover a lot of sensitive topics, but you do it in a very non-judgmental way. So you cover how to deal with our child's emotional outbursts, how we can uh, talk and engage with our little ones. But the way you sort of encourage parents to move away from sort of fear-based parenting strategies, you do it in a very inclusive way. So I wanted to start by asking, is that something that you sort of prioritise and try to focus on when you're creating and sharing content? I, I love that that's how my content comes to you, Tom, because it's really important to me that it's inclusive, that it's not just mothers. I mean, in my clinical work, I don't just work with mothers. I work with lots of fathers and I also work with grandparents. So I take a very holistic whole family approach. And actually, in lots of families, it's the grandparents who care for the children. So I see a lot of grandparents. I see lots of like diversity in families. And for me, being non-judgmental is really important because I think in order to like help people think about doing something different from either what they've learned or experienced or, you know, what they've read in a different book or something like that, to move them away from those kind of fear-based approaches, as you called them, I think it's important to connect with them. And I think if what, what I do or what other people do is place shame or blame on the parents then that just puts them in a defensive position and it stops openness to listening so i understand why parents might choose to do what they do like it actually makes sense that we might choose some of these approaches but they're often not the most helpful or beneficial like in the long term they might seem like they work in the short term but they don't really benefit our children or ourselves in our relationship with our children long term so yeah, being non-judgmental and inclusive is really important to me. So I do think about that quite carefully when I do a post or do a video or anything like that. And I think it's important that when you're creating content, let's say parenting without punishment, for example, you need to sort of present it for the people that need it most. So obviously yes. if there is shame and blame and judgment in there, it's just going to miss the mark completely, isn't it? Because it's not going to reach the people that maybe want to read that because it's going to they're just going to shut off if they feel blame or judged absolutely and i think most of us like people from my generation i'm a child of the 80s we received punishments right and also even as adults punishment is kind of like the norm in our society lots lots of the things that we do as adults some people feel like they do it because otherwise they receive a punishment and it's like the fear of the punishment that makes them behave well or to follow the rules or whatever it is. So I totally get that when we're talking about children and saying this isn't a very positive approach, like it's not helpful long term, that people kind of question it and it takes a bit of time to kind of really make sense of why a punishment might not be the best thing. It's really not the best thing for adults either, but... Our society is kind of based around punishment. So if you really think about it, that's that's what we have most of the time. Yeah, w one thing I wanted to sort of um, pick your brain about today, because something I'm trying to get a handle on, and I can never really find any comprehensive explanation about it online, and that's consequences. So um, yeah. 
now our little one is five years old and you know we're, we're sort of juggling with how do we use them effectively and i i've been um dming um a guy from meaningful ideas called vivek patel who's a proponent of non-coercive parenting which is focused on collaboration and he puts out some great content but i'm just i'm trying to find that balance between teaching our little mm. one you know if, if he's refusing to turn off the telly or if he's playing a little bit dangerously around our baby and he's you know he doesn't want to put down his toy sword how do we go about putting a consequence in place respectfully so i wanted to sort of pick your brain with your professional hat on if that's okay yeah absolutely so i think it's really interesting because i think consequences sometimes mask as punishments and yep. you know often when i speak to parents they say well my, i gave my child a consequence if what you do is give your child a consequence, then often what you're doing is choosing the consequence yourself. And it's still a power dynamic with your child. It is still a punishment that you're choosing, right? Like the TV example, if what you do is say, right, no more TV, you're not allowed to watch TV for the rest of the week, that might be a consequence that makes sense to you as an adult, but to a child, they're not going to connect their behavior with the TV. like. It doesn't make sense, especially around five years old. When children can't understand that their behavior has a consequence, which most little ones don't, like they're still exploring and practicing and figuring things out, they also don't understand that as adults are consequences about their behavior. They just see it as you're doing something mean, like, and, and then that becomes I'm mean or I'm bad, so they internalize it. So it's interesting because I'm not anti-consequence, so this is the nuance, right? But I am anti-consequences that are kind of forced on children, which is going to sound really weird, so I'll try and explain it. So there are natural consequences that happen to all of us all the time, and kids receive this all the time, you know? They play, they throw a toy and it breaks, that's a natural consequence, okay? For example, and so they're learning, if I throw something it might break, or I might lose something, or whatever it is. But the other types of consequences, if you're going to impose them, I think of them as boundaries. So I don't call them consequences because I try and move away from this kind of confusion between a consequence and a punishment. Because a boundary is about keeping your child safe. And a boundary is also something that you set. So yes, it's still set by you, the parent. You have some authority in your parenting with your child, but it's meant to keep you and them safe. Right? So for example, we can use your TV example. They want to watch TV, TV, TV. You might be thinking, but this isn't healthy for you. You've been here for however much time and it's time for you to do something else in the real world and switch your brain off from TV watching. To me, that's important as a parent that you're making a decision about what's healthy for your child because they might need some movement, but they might need some conversation. They might need, you know, an interaction that isn't passive because TV is very, very passive for children yeah. and for their brains. It's not great for their development long periods of TV. So you need to see that as I'm trying to help you and do something healthy, but obviously you're not going to understand it. For me, the boundary is about saying you're allowed to want more TV, but the TV is over now and you've got the right to switch off the TV. Does it have to come with a punishment because they're protesting? They're allowed TV tomorrow, maybe, if that's part of your family rhythm. That's fine. It's about then managing the protest and that child's emotional regulation and meeting them with empathy because what you've done to a child is taken away something they want. And if we connect with that as adults, that we can empathize with the fact that that's really hard, taking away something we want will make us want to protest and say, hey, what are you doing? I was enjoying that. So we need to move with our child in that sense. And when it comes to your baby, for me, that's a safety, you know, with the sword. It's about saying, yes, you're allowed to play with the sword, but it's not safe around baby sister. So you can either play with the sword in this other room or in the garden or later, or I'm gonna have to take the sword away from you. Now that's not a punishment because we're trying to keep our children safe, in, in this case, two little ones, and you're gonna give your child a choice. That's not a punishment. Because if what they say is, no, I wanna keep playing here, they're protesting, then the way that I move with that is by saying, okay, I'm gonna to have to help you. 
because you need to understand your child can't make a healthy choice in that moment. So you're saying, okay, I'm going to have to help you because now you're emotionally overwhelmed and I get it, but I'm gently going to remove the sword, put it somewhere inaccessible and remind your child you can have it later. The sword is yours. I haven't taken it away. I'm keeping you safe. And that's, I think, the difference. Now, I don't know how other people do it, but for me, it's about engaging willingness, cooperation, setting boundaries, keeping your children safe and empathizing with their wants, which are really intense in early childhood. But consequences that are punitive are not necessary, like, and they're not helpful in the long term. All that does is set a real power dynamic in your relationship with your child of you versus them and also me as the most powerful person that can really upset you because often with big consequences what we're trying to do is regain control of some situation where we feel helpless and I think that's the really important thing for us to connect with where we're saying no screens for a week or something like that is that the most helpful thing for your child and for you? Or is that you trying to feel like you're powerful and in control of a child who is crying and probably dysregulating your own nervous system and making you feel emotionally overwhelmed as well? One thing that's really working for us is managing the expectations ahead of time. So obviously we've got like a 19 week old at the moment. So the TV sometimes is leaned on a little bit whilst we sort the baby out, but it's managing the expectation ahead of time so we'll put on the telly we can watch it for we try not to associate time because obviously they have a little bit of a fuzzy concept of time we can watch one episode of Alvin in the Chipmunks and then we'll pause it and we'll do something else um, so that we're finding works really well but yeah it is one of the most popular DMs I receive from parents in terms of getting their children to turn off the telly and I think it is a big ask because often we're asking them to turn off the telly on our terms. So they might be in the middle of an episode of Alvin and the Chipmunks and just putting a, a, a boundary down immediately saying, right, we've got to go now. We've got to go out. Let's turn it off. That is a big ask, isn't it? Of a four yes, or five it year is. old. It is a big ask. So I would say, yes, managing their expectations is really important. So, you know, think about what you're happy to offer your child. It's the same way as offering most anything else that you give them like in terms of a schedule or a you know activity based time there's going to be a beginning and an end right so yeah I, I like to use visual timers but that have an auditory sound so that they can hear it and I would okay. usually set them a few minutes earlier so that when it goes you go oh hey after this episode is finished you know we're going to switch this off so you give them a little reminder but it's not a warning it's a reminder and then you don't need to warn them or count down, you know, in, you know, come on, I've asked you twice, turn off the TV. That's your responsibility. Like mm. if you're the one setting this schedule or this boundary, it's your responsibility to switch off the TV. It's too big an ask to, to think that a small child is going to go, I'm really enjoying this, but my mummy told me to turn it off. So I'm going to turn it off. Um, so I think that's really important to like also remember. And I think one of the reasons why TV is such a difficult one is because of what happens to children's brains when they're watching TV, which is that they kind of go into a dormant state. So sometimes what children need is a little bit of help to bring their brain back into the real world. So what I often suggest is alongside the alarm, when you come and say, hey, we're gonna switch off after this, bring your child a drink or even a very small snack and sit beside them and start to talk to them. So would you like a sip? You know, give them a drink or on their favorite bottle, whatever it is. Oh, what are you watching? Oh, what was this episode about? Oh, I can see Alvin's doing whatever he's doing. <laughs> Have a little chat with them. And what they start to do is they pull out of their semi-dormant state staring at the TV and they start to communicate with you. Water also changes their bodily state. So that can be a really helpful way of shifting them a little bit. So then when the credits come and the music comes first of all you're there so you're ready and you are with your child in that moment reminding them so now we're going to switch it off okay but tomorrow you're going to get a bit more okay or later or whatever you've agreed you're going to have more tv switch it off and then you go right what are we doing now you know whatever it is you move them on but sometimes that little connection just before yeah. you switch off the tv can really help yeah that's a really good tip i didn't even even think about that so just yeah instead of expecting that immediate switch that the telly goes off 
let's go out now it's just just giving them that bit of time collaborating with them and yeah just bringing them away from the telly slightly with that intense that intensity yeah it's it's really helpful for their brain because it just children's brains are much more sensitive to things like tv and so what happens is they get fully absorbed you know in whatever they're watching so when you then like ask them to switch it off they can't they can't actually do it they need a few like minutes of interaction with the real world to be able to do that one thing I've been doing with my guest is asking them to take me back to sort of the start of their own parenting journey. But in my sort of research for this episode, I've noticed that you had quite international upbringing. You've, you're fluent in Spanish and French as well as English. So yes. are, you, are you able to share a little bit about what your upbringing looked like and how you feel that sort of shaped the way you've decided to parent? Yeah, so I was brought up culturally in a Spanish, Hispanic culture, let's call it. Um, But I was brought up in a different country from the one I was born in and also different country from the one that my parents were raised in as well. So I was raised in Switzerland Um, and we moved there before I was two. So for me, Switzerland is home, but I would define myself as Spanish, which is why I often say to people that I'm international. Um, It's just much easier. (laughs) And then people will say, and why do you speak English? And I went to an international school where it was bilingual, so it was English and French because it was Switzerland. So I'm fully, actually French was my my second language and English is my third. So my mother tongue is Spanish and I still speak Spanish every day because my daughter speaks Spanish with me. Um, and she's fully bilingual and now wants to learn French because she's heard me speak in French. Um, so the multicultural bit is kind of like this merging of Hispanic cultures, very different from Swiss culture. And um, I went to an international school where many of my friends were from all over the world, but there were lots of Americans. And again, very different cultural kind of upbringing, different ideas they were bringing from like their parents, you know, they were allowed to do certain things that I wasn't allowed to do that would be seen in Spanish culture as being wrong or bad. And my parents were quite strict. So my parents were good 80s parents is what I think (laughs) of. Um, Yeah, definitely punishment based, kind of fear based, lots of control. They were very strict. They had very big, different rules for me and my brother because I'm a girl. So I got raised with different rules uh, because of the expectation of what little girls are supposed to be like. You need to remember, you know, if you're not Hispanic or Spanish, but it's a very religious culture. So both of my parents are Catholic. I'm not. I'm not religious at all. And they didn't raise me religiously, which is interesting. They made that choice. But they were raised very religious. Yeah. Yeah. They gave me and my brother a choice and I said no and he said yes. So he's Catholic and he's quite religious, but I'm not at all. Yeah. Um, it was a choice. Like we had a choice about whether we wanted to have a faith or not. And I was too interested in all these other cultures and all the things going on. I was like, <laughs> I don't want to pick one. I want to be like a citizen of the world. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think... How has that shaped me? I mean, I think it definitely has shaped me. I think I've got an openness, like a real curiosity for difference, um, both within myself, because I'm very different in my family. Also, I don't mind sharing it here, but my the brother I was raised with, we've got different dads. So I have, like, there's a big difference in my family between me, both ethnically, because I've got a different ethnicity to the rest of my family, um, and in terms of culture and the way I see the world, I think I just see it very differently. But I think my upbringing has given me that openness and that curiosity to explore things. Um, I've never been, I think of myself as a clinical psychologist as being quite eclectic. Like I don't really ascribe to having like one thing and being like, this is my thing. Like I'm a bit more fluid than that. Like I believe in taking what's useful to you and dropping what isn't. And I also really believe in this idea of there isn't a one fit for all, like at all is one of the things that I kind of grew up believing and thinking about. Like, um, 
I think the way that I was raised was not a very good fit for me, but I think it might have been a really a better fit for my brother. You know, like we talk about it, and I think it's personality, it's temperament, it's gender, it's um, yeah. all those different things. I think um, no parent is perfect. I have a very good relationship with my parents, by the way, and we have talked about things that I think they didn't get quite right with me and that they didn't see me or hear me or like actually try and get to know who I am. They just, you know, followed the rule book, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it created differences between me and my brother that I don't think that that was the intention ever. But it is, it is what happened. There were differences between me and him that in adulthood we've resolved, like together we're very close, like me and my brother are very close, but I think he would agree that the way I was treated was significantly different to how he was treated and it was a gender-based difference. And it's nice to hear you talk about, because th that there's often, you hear about breaking generational cycles and things like that, and it's nice to hear you still, sp like, you speak very respectfully of your parents, because we need to remember that, because um, my dad is Italian, and randomly, he was born in Ooh. Switzerland. Um, oh, wow, well, we've got, got a connection. <laughs> <laughs> he was, yeah, he was born in Switzerland, because my nan and granddad were working out there. They're both Italian. They then moved to England, and my uncle was born in England and my mum's Welsh um, and obviously my Italian grandparents had a certain way of raising my dad yeah. mm -hmm. um, but you can only obviously it's nice to reflect on it now but you can only do the best with the the upbringing you've had as an individual and your yes. beliefs and values and your personality so it's we sort of need to appreciate that when we think back to maybe how we were raised or how our parents were raised so I think you've got a very good outlook on the way you spoke about your parents there yeah I mean I really don't believe in blaming our parents like mm. I don't think blame helps anybody I do believe in understanding what's happened to you and sometimes you know I do do say this with like a caveat like if you feel like you were abused by your parents in any way to me, that's unexcusable. And yes, you can understand what might have led your parents to do certain things to you. But it doesn't mean you have to forgive that. Like, you know, so I think there's a cutoff here. But I think for me, when it, abuse is a very specific thing, obviously. And for me, when we blame our parents for not getting it right, we are missing the point that they were raised in a different culture at a different time. You know, it wasn't a time where there was any social media. My parents have never read a single parenting book. Like, absolute no way you know they did what was done to them they did what the norm was you know they followed this idea of like children need to be controlled all those kind of ideas which were really common are still quite common and I don't think they did anything with the intent to harm they did it to try and help me like they thought this was what was best for me and I understand that like I have compassion for that because they really did their best and like most people say, I turned out fine. Now, I don't think I turned out fine. I think I have worked very hard through lots of the things that I know were not quite right for me. Um, probably because of the career I've got, probably because of my personality, probably, you know, lots of things, my temperament, my curiosity. I have really looked at areas about my personality and things that aren't quite right, that didn't fit quite right when I started having relationships as an adult with others. And I was like, why do I do this? Or this doesn't feel okay. Like, where's this come from? That made me want to work on myself. And I, I'm a completely different person, like genuinely. And I think motherhood particularly has completely transformed me. Um, but I don't blame my parents for what they did. Like, I understand it, but I do believe in repair. So I do believe in the power of if I want to be close with my mum and dad, I also need to be open to being vulnerable and having uncomfortable conversations with them sometimes. And, you know, sometimes they will apologize, sometimes they won't, you know, because they're like, we did what was right. And that's okay. But they're obviously also witnessing something very different and how I parent my child. And that's bringing up stuff for them. So sometimes the conversation is now coming from them where they're saying, why are you doing that? You know, like, we never did that with you. You know, like, 
And so that is opening up curiosity from them and it's allowing me to explain what I'm doing with my child and what I think is best. And they still have doubts. You know, they are from a different generation. They'll be like, when your child's a teenager, this is gonna be really bad. And I'm like, actually, when she's a teenager, I think we're gonna be really close because of some of the things I'm doing. And actually, I think her emotional regulation is gonna be a lot better when she's a teenager than what I had when I was a teenager. So actually, I think she's, she's not gonna have those massive outbursts that they always remind me I used to have as a teenager because she's gonna she's got a different relationship with emotions you know she's four and she will sometimes she said this to me the other day she said mommy i really don't like the way you said that to me earlier she's four okay. and i said to her thank you thank you for saying that to me mommy was feeling really stressed i was it was in a moment of stress and i was like i'm really sorry mommy was feeling really stressed and you're right i was really snappy I'm so sorry I did that to you. I'm going to try really hard next time not to speak to you like that. And then she was like, that's okay, mummy. But I'm like, she's four. And we're able to have these conversations about our relationship and how we're interacting with each other. And she's able to say, I don't like the way you talk to me. And I don't tell her off for that. I connect with that because I'm like, well, this is about you and me. And of course, I don't want to make you feel bad or hurt. So... You know, those conversations that never would have happened in my house. No. Um, I would have never said that to my parents. <laughs> like, no way. So I think, you know, when they witness things like that, which has happened when we see them sometimes, that my daughter will say something, they'll be like, oh my God. Um, I'm like, you know, your concerns about her teenage years are not my concerns. Like, we're coming from a different place in a different position. But I think there's something quite beautiful in growing as an adult and as a parent and seeing older generations witness what we do. And yes, sometimes that can be really difficult, but I think there's something beautiful. We are showing them something that they've never experienced themselves, that they've never done themselves. And for some people that opens up possibility and a want to interact with their grandchildren differently sometimes, because I've got grandparents like that even in my community on Instagram who contact me and say, I'm doing something very different because of yeah. some of the information that's out there now. And I think that's really beautiful. And it I, I, th I think by sharing every day on the dad vibes, it's really helped me and my wife with our boundaries because our parents just get the way we want to parent and they're super respectful of that because I know a few parents have reached out to me and they really struggle with maybe their mother-in-law in... -law in they're not agreeing with the way they're raising their child and when the mother-in-law is with the child they behave a certain way um, but we just don't experience any of that probably because I'm so vocal about how I want to parent and yeah I think they're, they're super respectful which I'm lucky for but I think parents certainly need to hold those boundaries don't they? Yes and I think it's about feeling confident in yourself that you know what's right for your child yeah it's your child and I say that a lot like to parents that they're the expert in their children, not me, not their parents, not their friends, them. Like, you know your child best, so, you know, trust your gut instinct. Even when other voices or other people are saying to you, that's wrong, don't do that, you know, like, or you're creating a rod for your own back or whatever it is, you know, just remind yourself, I know my child, this is what feels right in this moment, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, and sometimes, you don't need to justify what you're doing or explain no. it to people. No. You know, like you said about setting a boundary, sometimes it's about saying, I'm doing my best. You know, kind of, sometimes we need to remind parents or older generations, like we're also just doing our best. And of course we're gonna get things wrong. Like I say this all the time to my husband and you know, like we're gonna get things wrong. And one day our daughter's gonna turn around and go, you messed up. And I'll be like, yeah, <laughs> and that's okay. Like I did my best and thank you for having this conversation with me because if we're having that conversation, it must mean we're having a good relationship because no child who doesn't want a relationship with their parent has that conversation. If you don't want a relationship with your parent, you just cut off the ties and you walk away. If you want a relationship, you have that conversation as uncomfortable as it is. Yeah. And talking of your daughter, are you able to share a little bit about um, your transition into parenting life? Sort of, um, where were you in your life when you decided, right, it's time to have a little one? And how was, how was that journey for you? 
was, I am a child, I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm a child specialising in children and I love my job. So the first thing I'll say is I absolutely love my job. I love working with children and families. Um, I was working in the NHS in paediatrics. I worked with children who had physical illnesses and chronic health conditions um, like you know, oncology, cardiology, neurology, cystic fibrosis, lots and lots and lots um, oh, wow. across the years. And I was really passionate about my role and I loved my career. So as much as, and I love children because that's my job, right? But as much as that was true, I wasn't sure that I wanted my own child. And um, my husband and I were, have been together for 15 years nearly. Um, and it took us a long time like a very long time to say are we going to do this and I guess the thing that kind of turned it for me was well, first of all understanding more about myself and my like identity like personally um meeting I have more brothers than I was raised with and meeting them and their families I had this real sense of wanting my tribe like, mm. that's my word, because that's what it felt like. I was like, you know what? I want my own tribe. And I really want a kid. And suddenly the want became really big. <laughs> so it went from being really ambivalent to, and like wanting to protect my career, to saying, I really want a child. Like, I really, really want a child now. And at that point I was, how old was I when I had my daughter? 37. Right. Um, and she came very quickly into our lives. We, I feel like a privilege, you know, such a privilege. I always call her my little miracle because I really wanted a baby and she happened very fast, like to the point where we didn't really have time to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, oh, wait a minute. We went from wanting to now it's happening. Um, so it was a very quick transition. Um, and... I think, you know, coming into motherhood was really hard at the beginning because it just, I would say, you know, the matricence part, um, you know, that kind of evolution as a mother in, in my identity from like woman to mother, which is a little bit like adolescence. There were, I was, there were lots of mixed feelings and lots of things happened when my little one was born. But then I very quickly like bonded with her, really connected with my child. And we have a really strong connection. Um, and I loved it. Like I loved it so much that suddenly I was like, oh, I'm not sure about my career anymore. <laughs> I kind of flipped. Um, and then I went back to the NHS, but it was locked down and I was there for about a year. And then I kind of moved away. So I don't work for the NHS anymore. Right. I still work as a clinical psychologist. I still see families, but I do so privately do my private work instead. But I've done that to give myself, it's a very privileged choice, but I, we have done that as a family, as a couple, because I spend more time with my daughter. So I get to pick her up and drop her off. And I have two days a week where she's with me. And these are my choices. And she's going to school in September. So those two days are gone, you know, like she'll yeah. be at school full time so it's and I knew there would be an ending but I was like in these early years this is my choice like I really want to be a part of her life are um, you prepared for the are you prepared mentally for that transition to school because we had Luca went to school in September and we were basically home with him for two, he didn't start any form of nursery till he was three and then um we were obviously lockdown started when he just turned two so that we str both struggled, I think, when he started school. You just sat at home. Obviously, we work from home, but it's just... Yeah. It, it's different, isn't it? Not having it them is. around and having them start their own life and make their own friends. And he's got this whole little world now going on. Um, but yeah, it was a big transition for us. It's very bittersweet, isn't it? Kind of yeah. watching your children grow up. Am I prepared mentally? I think as much as I can be. I think nothing really prepares you for the experiences you end up having as a parent. They're so unique and individual. And you know, I don't know what it will be like. The thing that helps me is kind of witnessing how my daughter is actually ready. She's completely ready to go to mm. school. Like lots of the things that she does, she's very independent. She's very strong-willed, um, but she's very independent, She, do, you know, and she she loves the idea of reading and writing and 
you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think she's definitely ready. So me witnessing that makes me think she's ready, you know? I need to support her in moving forward rather than like hold her because I want to keep her as my little one. Um, Because there is beauty in watching our children grow and become their own people. There is a lot of, I find that very beautiful, but it's also kind of bittersweet because it's a separation, isn't it? Like over time, that's what we're doing as parents which if you think about it too much becomes quite an emotive topic, I think. But everything you do throughout your child's childhood is about separating and letting them go. That's that's all we're doing all the time. Yeah. So even when I talk about connect, yes, it's connect in that moment, but it is connect to let go. We're kind of filling our children with all these really good things in our relationship with them so that they can carry that forward into the world with other people. It's not yeah. so that they stay with us, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think, um, so I, I engage with a lot of parents that homeschool and things like that. So, and sometimes those conversations on social media can get a little bit judgmental and toxic. So it got to the point where I was built this narrative of what reception um would be like and it's completely been squashed it's you know very laid back they do a lot of free play um and in my head I was like you know it's going to be strict he's going to have to sit on a desk for six hours a day and it's just not like that at all and I've been blown away by how much he's thrived and learned since September um because we did mostly learning through play so we didn't do much Mm. Um, writing with him he he could just about write his name before he went to school and now he's reading sentences he's writing sentences he's speaking in Welsh because we live in Wales and they do a Welsh curriculum amazing I hope uh, the school she's going to will be as lovely as the school your son goes to because that sounds wonderful cool so one question I did want to um, dive into before we go is the parents that reach out to me um, that struggle with their own emotions They often snap and lose it with their children. What recommendations or strategies can you give those parents? Let's say they've completely lost it with their child. It's going to happen. We're only human. We make mistakes. What are the steps maybe they can take with their little one once they've done that? So I think for me that the big step is repair. Okay, like we all lose our cool or at some point you know remember that you're human you're probably tired depleted at the end of your tether and that's when it happens and it's about making sure that you repair firstly with yourself because often when parents do that the first thing that happens is they guilt or even shame themselves for it I'm a bad parent I'm so terrible I'm a monster even those kind of things so it's really important that you start by repairing with yourself So tell yourself a story of what happened, but put it into perspective. And I often will say this to parents, think about what you would say to a best friend. Think about what words you would use if your friend called you and said, I just shouted at my kid and I feel like I'm a monster and I'm a terrible parent. What would you say to them? And often the kind of things that we say to others are things like, well, you were tired. Like, it's normal to shout sometimes. You are a good parent. Think of all these other things that you do really nicely and think of how much your child loves you and all that kind of stuff. And then once you've done that and kind of forgiven yourself, because you do need to repair with you and kind of say, I shouted because. So you can also use that word if that's useful. It's a little trick, but it can help. Why did you shout? Because, you know, what led you to shouting? And don't blame your child, right? Even if it's... They didn't switch off the TV. Now, why did you shout? Because I'm really tired or I was under pressure or we needed to leave the house. Those are the real reasons, not the kid. It's never really the kid. And then you want to go to your child and you want to repair with them. And what repair is, it's a meaningful apology. It's not an excuse for your behavior. It's an acknowledgement of your behavior. So you have to take responsibility for what you did. And as adults and parents... It's always us that have to apologize for what we do. We cannot blame our children for shouting at them. The shouting is under our control. We can't stop our child from shouting because we can't control them, but we can definitely control ourselves. So, you know, uh, a simple repair might sound like, I'm really sorry I shouted at you before. I got angry and that is me. That is my emotion. It is not your fault that I shouted. 
I'm going to try really hard to work on calming myself down or letting you know when I'm really angry and just taking a break next time because I don't feel okay shouting at you, for example. Yeah. And for me, once you do the repair and you acknowledge it out loud with a child, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take lots of practices and lots of instances. But one of the things that you can begin to work on as a parent is your triggers. Like, what are the things that make you shout, scream, you know, let rip on your child? How can you pause it before you do it? How, rather than venting it out, what do you need in that moment? And I often say to parents, it's okay to walk away. Just tell them, I'm taking a break. You know, I'm, I'm feeling really angry right now. <sighs> I need to breathe. I'll be back. And your child might still be raging. It's okay. Two seconds out of the room can be enough. Breathe. Remind yourself something. Give yourself a mantra. I always say to myself, this anger I see is not about me. That helps me. Like reminding myself that my child's experience and emotional distress is not personal to me. It's their experience. And then you come back in and hopefully with a bit of a plan, okay, this is what I'm going to do because you've had a bit of that mental space to think and respond. And the more you practice that, and it's really hard to do, but the more you do it, the easier it will become because what you're learning as an adult is how to regulate your own emotions. And yeah. it's really hard work if you didn't learn this in childhood. So, so you've obviously made a mistake and I know some parents can struggle with acknowledging that they've made a mistake but I think that's the first step once you can acknowledge that you've made a mistake that's an important first step and then it actually turns these situations in, into an opportunity like you say to teach your child to help build those foundations for emotional intelligence and I think letting them know that humans can make mistakes and yes. still be okay and I think yes, that's really absolutely. important yeah we're also teaching our children that it's not about being perfect and you yeah. know never shouting like one of the things i do say is you know good parents are not the ones who never shout at their children it's the parents who repair yeah because this idea of like you never shout at them like i think it's a bit of utopia like i don't know who that is because you know i sometimes get louder and like i shared in that example earlier like yeah i sometimes will get snappy i'm a human and like i'm a mum with like a million things to juggle that's normal <laughs> but the difference is you know, hopefully I'm a good enough parent because what I always do is repair and I always acknowledge when I get it wrong. And I show my child how I've behaved is not okay, which also is offering her a template of how to be with others in relationships when she loses it. She's really good at repairing and apologizing herself, but she's learning, okay, if I do this to somebody, then the right step is to say, I'm sorry, you know, and to acknowledge what I've done. But also if that ever gets done to her, that she's aware and conscious that that behavior is not okay. And that if the repair doesn't yeah. happen, then there's something off in that relationship because this is what she's experienced since she was little, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's really important. Thank you for that. That was super helpful. So to close out, I've been asking my guests three questions. So firstly, okay. they're just quick fire, so you don't need to overthink them. Um, <laughs> okay. Knowing what you know now, what parenting advice would you give yourself before you became a parent? It is going to be really hard. But the moments of like beauty and wonder that your child is going to give you are going to outweigh that by like a thousand. Yeah. Because yeah. I think we talk about how hard parenting is because it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's really hard. But... I think I would have wanted to know how much like wonder I was going to have about everything ever since, you know, she, even when she was a tiny baby, like she first started to grab things. I was like in awe of her, you know, like just or the little, you know, the conversation I said before that first time it wasn't the first time, but the first time that she said to me, I don't really like when you said this to me or, you know, that it's going to really like, oh my God, like really amaze me and also make me feel like I am a good enough parent because I'm witnessing yeah. my child do things, you know, in ways that I don't expect, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I think I would have wanted a reminder of that too. Yeah, I think even, at it, like you say, in the baby stage, so the, 
with our newborn the fourth trimester was absolutely tough you know we just had to hunker yeah. down and, and get through the lack of sleep and things like that but yeah. now that she's starting to do little things like start tracking us around the room like they're just such magical moments aren't they for the first time um, yeah they and are and I think we just we, they can get dismissed when mm. things are difficult right in the struggle that's all we see but there's there's something else on top that is yeah. the stuff that keeps us going, I think, as parents. Um, so question two is, what's the one thing you feel you need to work on personally as a parent? My emotional regulation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, really big one. I think I'm miles beyond how I used to be before I was a mother, let, you know, let alone with my child. But yes, like I am, I'm a very passionate person, like just in general, like that's just kind of my personality. And yeah, I think, you know, nobody really taught me how to be angry. Okay. No one's taught me people, you know, the way I was brought up was you're not supposed to be angry. Anger is bad. Yeah. So learning how to be angry with my child is so important, so key. Yeah. And I would say that it's really transformed my relationship with my husband. Um, we're both working on it, but diff you know, he was, he's got a different lesson, which is I'm allowed to be angry, but I have no other feelings. So together we are working on slightly different things, but actually it's really changed our relationship. And even the way that we argue is very different. Okay. We are much, much better at like practicing the kind of the pause or this conversation is getting a bit heated. I think I need to take a moment. And we've talked about it separately, away from our child, of course, mm. and just said, wow, something's better. Like something's really different between you and I. Like we can actually communicate when things are getting intense. We can take a pause. And so that's helped us do what we do with our child way better and be able to kind of have conflict together in a much more kind of healthy way than we used to before she came along. Yeah, that's important because it's not talked about enough, I don't think, the pressure on relationships when you have a child because randomly, we, me and my wife have noticed that we've just started all of a sudden since we've had our second point scoring a lot, who's doing what, who's doing more of this and it, it escalates quite quick. So just identifying that has helped us tone that back a bit. But yeah, I think more needs to be said about um, maybe the challenges that relationships face during... Um, during parenthood yeah absolutely and also just small tokens of appreciation of each other mm. yeah that i think again in the juggle get missed but just appreciating what the other is doing for you for your children you know not taking those things for granted can actually feel really meaningful because you're being noticed by your partner if that makes yeah. sense and that again is one of those things that just gets missed by the wayside but actually is really important yeah um, and finally, to close out, what would you say is the best thing about being a parent? I think the best thing for me becoming a mother was kind of expanding my heart. Like, I love so much more <laughs> than before I had my own child. Like, not just my child, but I love myself so much more. Like, I love my body for creating this incredible human because I, I still think it's incredible that we create humans. Um, you know, I love my partner because I see so much of him in her. Um, so many bits of him I see in her and like, it just makes me smile like they have the same toes. <laughs> it's really random, <laughs> but I love that. Like I see her feet and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's got her dad's feet and that makes me laugh. And you know, kind of just, I feel like my heart has expanded. My heart mm. is bigger. I feel like I'm a much more loving person possibly with more empathy you know throw that in there as well but there is something about my love growing in a way that I never ever expected it is one of those like unexpected outcomes for me I, yeah. I kind of hoped I would love my child but I didn't suddenly think I would look at myself and think that I love me and I love my body I've always had quite a negative outlook I'm a woman but <laughs> like a negative outlook on my body will be quite critical and some of that has definitely shrunk since I had a child because I'm grateful that my body could do this and you know I'm grateful to my husband that he's by our side and that we're like yeah we're our little tribe now so I think that's probably mine <laughs>
it, it's amazing to see how much lo- how love does expand because I remember worrying because Luca was four and a half, just over four and a half when we had Mia. So it was just the three of us. We did everything together. And when Mia came along, obviously we didn't know her yet. We were just responding to her needs. We didn't really see her personality until she started engaging with us. Um, so now she's 19 weeks. That love has just got even stronger with her and she's now part of the tribe, as you call it. And I couldn't imagine our tribe without her. So it's amazing to to be consciously aware that that love just naturally expands as your tribe grows. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Yeah, that's really nice. Thank you for joining me today, Marta. Really appreciate your time, and it was good to um, touch into some of maybe your professional experiences, but also chat to you as a mother as well, um, because I see a lot of your content online, and I really wanted to just chat to you with your with your mum hat on and, and hear some of your experiences. So thanks for thanks for sharing. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Well, thanks for joining me and we'll touch base soon. Bye.